Let's check out today's conversation. Mike sits down with agency owner Angela Hansen. We get to follow along the evolution of Angela's career mindset, starting with her challenge to overcome shyness. Not confident in myself, not confident in the career choice. Didn't really know if I could talk to people. To developing serious mental persistence. So my dad said, you can either accept defeat and move on, find you somewhere else to work, or show up in that man's office every single week until he gives you the job. To the day that her mindset truly paid off your agency owner of the year out of all the agency owners. What did that mean? One of the proudest moments of my career. I couldn't believe it. All of this coming up next on The Level Up Lifestyle. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Level Up Lifestyle podcast. I'm Mike Sheets coming to you live from the Globe Live Studios in McKinney, Texas. And we have a Great guest with us today, Miss Angela Hansen. Hey, Angela, how are you? I'm good, Mike. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, season two uh, is all about mindset. So, Angela, we're going to get into your mindset at various stages in in your life and in your career. Obviously, you have a, a ton of success. You're a, a for everyone listening here, an agency owner with Globe Life Liberty National Division. Uh, how long have you been an agency owner? Since 2008. Okay, so a while, right? Wow. You've, you've been an agency owner for a while, and you have how many offices total? I have five. Five offices in Alabama and Georgia. Correct. Right. Your your main office is in the um, big city of Alexander City. That's correct. That's right. Yeah. You got a city in the name, so you know it's 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 a it's the big. How many people live in Alex City? Uh, roughly about twelve thousand. Twelve thousand, and your agency produces about how much you what did you write last year? 3.6 million. 3.6 million out of a out of a small town in four others. Correct. Right, in four others. So, um just a ton of success. Uh you're the only person that has ever won the agency owner of the year back to back in 2018 and 2019. So, we're going to get to that uh, a lot of a lot of great stories along the way in the mindset that helped you achieve all that. So, are uh, you ready to dig in? I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. So, tell me about you. Where'd you Where'd you grow up, and how'd you get started? I grew up in Alexander City, of course, right. my hometown. Grew up very middle class, family of five, three kids, two adults. My mom never worked growing up. She was a stay at home mom. Very loving family. You know, my parents always thought that the reason they didn't do as well financially as some other families in the community was because they didn't have a college education. Gotcha. So growing up, um, all I heard all my life was go to school, get a college degree. We want your life to be easier than what ours has been. So, you know, if we ever wanted for money, I never knew it, but what, apparently. What'd your dad do for work? My dad owned his own business. Okay. Doing what? He owned a service station, a garage. Oh, okay. Yep. All Been right. doing that. Still still in business today. Really? Yep. Bought the business when I was like 18 months old. Okay. And he's 73 now and still doing it every day. Of wow, course, his cool. hours have changed greatly. He right. just works when he wants to. Sure. But, sure. You know, he has to have something to go do is what mom said, because <laughs> he can't stay around the house with her because she's she's she says it's just too much time together. Yeah. And they've right. been married for actually the 13th of this month. They've been married for 53 years. Oh, wow. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah, that's great. So so they're they're early on. They're impressing on you the the importance of education, education. So coming up through school, are you are you doing well in school or is school kind oh. of, you know, I was an average student. I wasn't. I mean, I was an honor roll student, AB. Yeah. I wasn't a you know a scholar or anything like that. Right. But, you know, I, when you graduate high school and all your friends are going to college, you kind of want to go to college too. Sure. So you know, it was kind of like just the thing to do. Yeah. And it didn't help or hurt that you know my parents had always said, "Let's go to college. Let's get a degree." So when I was ready to go to college, I was like, "All right, how are we paying for this?" <laughs> And my dad kind of giggled and said, I don't know. We I don't, don't know. You college, tell me. <laughs> we don't have a college fund for you. And I was like, so I had a brother and a sister who had college funds. And I was like, well, why didn't I ever have one? They said, well, we just didn't know that you'd be the college kind of go in person. We didn't figure you'd really? ever want to go. So I was at a dilemma, a crossroads. I figured, you know, how am I going to pay for this? Yeah. Well, thank goodness for student loans. And yeah. those things are amazing if you utilize them in the right way. Right. So So you did go to college. I did. Where'd you go? Auburn University. Oh, okay. All right. Um, and when you're at Auburn, what are you what are you going to school for? <laughs> well, 
I'm going to school. Um, I had worked during the summer at a um, the local hospital there in Alexander City in the okay. physical therapy department. So I thought I wanted to go be a physical therapist. Okay. So I was taking a lot of science classes, a lot of math, a lot of physics, things of that nature. And then I realized that I didn't want to be a physical therapist. So I just kind of basically got my degree in anything that I could possibly get it in, which was a, mi- a major in biology and a minor in psychology. Okay. So, so uh, what are you going to do with that? Like, you're, is it just something that was interesting <sighs> don't, to you? <laughs> don't, don't really know what I was going to do with yeah. it. I was just going to say I had a college degree. I mean, you can work in, you know, there's a lot of things you could do with it in the biohazard part of the world, okay. things of that nature. So that's kind of what I was planning on. But it didn't kind of work out that way because I didn't want to move out of my small town. I wanted to stay where I grew up and there's families just there. Families there, you know, it's, yeah. A lot of people didn't move off. You know, you just kind of stay around where you grew up. So, yeah. you know, graduated, looked for a job for six months after graduating, couldn't find one. And lo and behold, my dad's Liberty National agent came and was reviewing the policies that he's now had with this company for 35 years. And the agent that was reviewing the policies told my dad that Globe Life Liberty National was hiring. So my dad was like, really? <laughs> I know someone who yeah, needs a job. <laughs> I know somebody that needs a job. <laughs> So my dad was all excited, Mike. He called me up and he said, hey, great news. I've got you a job interview. And I said, great. Where is it? And he said, Liberty National. And I laughed today because I I said, I don't even know what that is. And he said, (laughs) it's an insurance company. And I said. Doesn't have anything to do with biology or psychology. I'm like, (laughs) what? what? I'm not going to this interview. I'm too quiet. I'm too shy. I'm not doing this. I I don't want to sell insurance for a living. And he said, I don't think you understand. You're living under our roof. You got no job. It's time for you to get out and do something. It's been six months. So, so, so you graduated college, mm-hmm. moved back home. I did. Living with your parents, yep. looking for a job. Okay. Yep. So uh, you didn't really have a choice then? Not when you live under my parents' <laughs> roof. Um, my parents brought us up. You know, they were very strict in what we were allowed to do and what we were not allowed to do. Um, which is great because, you know, that made me the person I am today with their great upbringing. At the yeah. time, you don't think it is because right. you think they're being too strict. But, you know, a parent's job is to protect you from the of dangers course. you don't already know. So of course. so my dad was very, um, he was very, very adamant that I was going to this job interview, regardless if I took the job or not. And when I sat through the job interview, I'm sitting there thinking, I'm not doing this. I don't even know why I'm here. Look around. I this is not what I want to do. I didn't yeah. see myself doing this. And then when I saw the presentation, when I saw that it really wasn't selling insurance, it's literally getting to help people in the worst days of their lives and mm-hmm. making a difference in the world we live in today. I wanted the career. When I saw the uh, potential income you could make, that really set me on fire because when you live in small town Alexander City, you're either a doctor or a lawyer or you worked at the Russell Corporation, which is no longer even in business there. Mm. That was what you did for income. Those so, are the top three. Those are the That's top it. three. That's yeah. what you did. And, you know, when I saw the amount of money you can make with Liberty, I was like, man, is this real? Yeah. You know, a lot of people still ask me today, is it real? Right. Right. It, it You know, we sometimes we talk about it um, is you have in your mind, like, what you want in life, right? Right. You know, you, you kind of know, like, I want to live this kind of life. But Correct. You don't know how am I going to do it. So I think a lot of people can relate to that where, you know, they have in their head, like, this is what I want to do in terms of how I want to live. But what am I going to do to earn the income necessary to to do that? A lot of people think, well, I would never do insurance. No. You know, and then you realize that, okay, you know what? Maybe I, maybe I would do that to have that. Absolutely. It's the vehicle you drive to get to the lifestyle that you want. Yeah. You know, and. But the owner at that time decided that I wasn't a good fit for what he was looking for. He told me that I was 24, living at home with my parents and didn't have any financial responsibility that he didn't want to hire me. Didn't think you were going to be motivated or just back in the 1998 when I was hired, everybody had been there for years and years. And it was just rare that somebody retired or uh-huh. passed away. That's how they basically hired new people. Yeah. It, it's so, a different time in the was. company, right? You Absolutely. Know, so, you know, it's it, – yeah, and you said something interesting, too, that I want to come back to is that you said that at this time, one of the reasons why you didn't want to come into the interview is because you were shy and quiet. Correct. Which this is a whole other Angela Hansen that I did not know existed at one point where you're shy and quiet. So um, tell me about that. I mean, did you were just not 
sure of maybe just not confident in yourself or of what you wanted to do or not confident in myself, not confident in the career choice, you know, just didn't really know if I could talk to people because, yeah. you know, that's what we do for a living is we literally talk to people. Right. Never had a problem talking just about important matters to people when it affects their lives. That kind of scared me just a little bit. We're, we have, where I was going to say, were you apprehensive at, you know, at this time you're like early twenties, probably 24. right. Yeah. 24. And here you're, 24-year-old female going into a home of somebody who's maybe 50 years old, married, making a financial decision, like, why are they going to listen to me? Like, they're not going to, you know, like, how am I going to be confident in that? Was that also kind of a a fear or an uncertainty? Oh, absolutely. That was a fear. Because you're right, 24, going to people's homes that have had insurance with Liberty National for years, because back then you were assigned a servicing agency, a servicing debit, is what they called it. So you had a special route you had to run. I it's didn't, a group of people that you're going to go see. people that you're assigned to once a year, that this is who you're responsible for taking care of, and you're going to make sure that all their financial needs are met, you know, on the worst days of their lives. And it was just terrifying to me because I thought, who's going to listen to a 24-year-old, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it, it was just, it, it's just the mindset of, of terrified. Yeah. Yeah. Because I didn't want to make a mistake. I didn't want to mess up somebody's life. Sure. You know? Yeah, it's it, what we do makes a di- you know makes it, an impact. It makes an impact. Yeah, good and bad. Absolutely. Right. So uh, it's uh, a terrifying proposition in a way of doing this. Uh, the agency owner um, at the time, I guess they were called branch managers or district managers. Branch at the managers. Time, branch managers. Um, at that time, uh, also probably felt the same way <laughs> about it. So. Uh, you, you came back, though, yeah. um, and, and so you overcame that fear or something was motivating you to, I mean, I, I think it could have been easy to say, yeah, you know, I don't really feel confident doing this. And the boss says, yeah, I don't think you'd be very confident doing this either and say, okay, well, thanks for your time and move on. But something sparked you to come back. So what was that? The lifestyle that mm. I saw all the people in that office that we're living because once you start interviewing with an agency you start you know researching them and looking at their lifestyle and how successful 95 percent of them had been and i wanted that lifestyle so my dad said you can either accept defeat and move on find you somewhere else to work doing whatever you want to do or show up in that man's office every single week until he gives you the job and it took me three months of showing up in his office at least once a week wow sitting in the lobby waiting for him to have five minutes of free time Till finally I wore him down and he said, Lord, child, if you'll just leave me alone, (laughs) you can have the job. And my very first day was December the 28th, 1998. Wow. It almost sounds like a movie in a way. Like, you know, it's like, no, it's not for you. And then you you want it and you keep coming back. But I'm I'm sure the first couple times where you're sitting in that office, they almost were like, what What is she doing here? Why are you here? Why are you here? We told you no. Yeah. And I said, well, eventually somebody's got to retire. Eventually, somebody's got to have an opening somewhere. So what's the mindset in that 90 days? I'm sure there was a point where you thought, okay, I, I'm just going to. Uh, oh, absolutely. You know. I thought about giving up. But then yeah. I then I circle back to, and, and I hate to make it sound like it's all about money, but it's not. When you live in a small town, you know, income is important. Sure. So. I had been on other job interviews during that 90 days, and I'd been told the same thing over and over again. You know, you're overqualified, you're underqualified, don't call us, we'll call you, we'll keep your resume on file. So it wasn't just the mindset of him telling me no, it was the mindset of everybody else telling me no, too. Because I had my heart set on not moving. Yeah. You know, and I even thought about commuting to Birmingham or Montgomery every day. And then, you know, that gets to be a toll on you with, with the commute at least an hour and 20 minutes away. So, you know, just finally just believing in the fact that he's got to eventually break. I got to I got to break him. It became a game. <laughs> you know, it was like, is he going to say yes today? Yeah. Or, you know, is he going to still tell me no? But he's got to know that when that one opening does come up, I want my name to be the first one that he thinks of out of all the other candidates that he has. Yeah. Because back then we had to take an aptitude test. Really? Yes. Okay. Had to take an aptitude test. Had to be past that. Had you, to, you had already done that. I'd already though, done all the, this. Yeah, so, you know, I'm yeah. just waiting for him to tell me, you know, I'm ready to go. And I don't know what changed his mind, I guess, because I really did worry him to death. Yeah. 
I mean, imagine somebody sitting outside your office once a week for three months. What would you do? Right, right. And if you think that person isn't going to make it, then okay, well, now let's let's see. And, and, you know, and who knows? You know, we take a risk every day of not knowing if someone's going to make it or not. Yeah. So. Where did that persistence come from? Is that just a a, a product of your upbringing? Yes. Yeah. My parents and stuff that. We didn't quit. We don't fail. And no matter how tough it gets, you just keep persevering. Mm. So. Yeah, it, it's. I, I'm sure you know you can reflect back now, but it just if, if you think like you know maybe there was one day in that 90 day period where you're just like really questioning why am I driving to this oh. office again, and if you would have let yourself win that argument to not show up, how different your life could be oh, now, right? Absolutely. Without that persistence, I wouldn't be the person I am today if it wasn't for that persistency. Yeah, yeah. So uh, eventually they break. They break. Probably to get you just to stop showing up Probably. unexpectedly, right? Probably. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Show me what you got. Show me what you got. And uh, just straight out of the gates, just on fire, doing oh, I everything wished it was great. That way. <laughs> I, I wish it was that way, Mike. Okay. Um, straight out of the gates, I was a slow learner because it was a little bit harder than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. You know, um, slow learner, went through all the training. My manager rode with me for six weeks. And at the end of six weeks, I had to be field certified and released. You know, that was just... Was that like the normal length of time back then? Okay. That was the normal. He rode with me for six weeks. So on my sixth week, I was released. And I remember riding around for hours before I'd go to my first appointment. Probably missed my first appointment because I was so terrified of going in this... Just driving in circles? Just driving in circles around town, trying to figure out anything I could do not to go to this lady's house. Because I was so terrified because I was first time by myself. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this 70-year-old or the 60-year-old man that's been training me that's been my security blanket's not here anymore. You know, what am I going to do? Are they going to are they going to trust me? They going Are they going to listen to me? Yeah. Do I know what I'm doing? Yeah. You know, have I really got this? Some of that doubt is creeping back up. Some of that doubt up. creep back up. Yeah. And, you know, and finally I was like, all right, just rip the Band-Aid off. So I went to my appointment, uh, did the presentation with a lady, and I sold her a cancer policy. I'll never forget it. And that cancer policy is still in the books today. Wow. So, you know, and then that's when the belief came, okay, I got this. Yeah. I got this. Not only did she listen to me, she allowed me to protect her family. Sure. So. Sure. So then it was there just a learning curve, though, like uh, besides that, just that first appointment? Uh, oh, gosh. Just, yes, there was, I just got lucky that first time. Yeah. I'm just going to be real honest with you because there was a learning curve. Like. Um, and how did you get through that? <sighs> Lots of coaching from my um, agency director at the time. Uh Um, He was very knowledgeable in the industry, had been very successful with Liberty National, um, prior Marine. Okay. So he had that drive and that that energy that just made you gravitate toward him. And he, after talking with him, he'd pep talk you up and you just didn't want to quit. You want to go run through a brick wall for him. Yeah. So didn't want to let him down. Sure. Because he'd already spent six weeks of his life with me, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> didn't want to fail him. Right. Didn't want to fail myself and didn't want to fail my parents. Was was the agent who originally recruited you, was was he involved in that as well? That's not the manager, right? That's a different no, person? Yeah. his name was Oscar Thompson. Okay. He originally recruited me. And is he still kind of involved in mentoring you at this point? He, no, I just at this point in your career, though, yes, was he? yes. Yeah. He was. He would give me the pep talks at the coffee maker and say, hang in there, girl. You're going to have good days and bad days. Just don't let one bad day make it a career. Yeah. You know, keep coming back. And he would tell me the stories of him being there for 15 years and still having bad days. Yeah. And, you know, you just got to keep coming back. And you said Oscar's he's still around. He's retired he's, now. He's retired. Yeah. Living the good life. There you go. There you go. Um, and is the agency owner, the branch manager at this time, uh, as you're kind of coming up, like trying to figure it out is is there like a, oh I told you like maybe this wasn't a good idea or uh, let's oh yeah you know a little bit of that it going was, it, too. Was, it was a little bit a little bit of that a little bit of let me coach you up you know because I didn't want to let him down either sure you know and then you know I didn't tell you this but my own mother told me that I wouldn't be successful doing this really? like my dad was really a big advocate for me coming to work but my mom was like you're crazy you've lost your mind so in the back of my head. That's always playing there. Like she says, I can't do this. So I got to prove to her that I can. Yeah. And, you know, it was it was a tough first year. 
that's that's got to be such a big motivator, though, is almost to like you want to be successful, but you also want to prove people wrong. Absolutely. You know, um, it's easy to quit. Yeah. And that would have been the easy thing to do and go find something else to do. But I was just so determined that I wasn't going to let I, I wasn't going to fail the branch manager or the at the time who finally believed in me after three months and gave me the opportunity. I wasn't going to let him say, you know, I was right. Yeah. There was a lady in the office. I won't call her name, but she actually let me overhear a conversation one day that I wasn't supposed to, that she said I wouldn't make it three months. Wow. Yeah. And she was the only lady in the office besides myself Mm. because it was a predominantly man's world. Sure. So I had to prove to her that I would be around three months. Yeah. Did you feel that was a little bit of a challenge too? Just oh, gosh, the, yes. you know, the man's world culture oh, yeah. and all that. Oh yeah. What was your mindset to get through that? Well, I work better with men, so that's a good thing. Okay. Less drama. <laughs> <laughs> you get a room full of women, you get, sometimes get a little drama going and that's hard to, you know, um hard to overcome the drama. But they didn't treat me like the outsider. They all of them welcomed me in. Okay. So it was an easy transition for me. Yeah. So it was maybe the perception then reality type of a thing. Like, okay, oh, it's, yeah. it's mainly but that. But you see but. the agency meeting and it's one woman and then there's me in the back yeah. of the room who's, you know, trying to find her way. Quiet, shy, Quiet, Angela shy. Yeah. Hansen in the, in the I back. I know you don't believe that, yeah. but I promise you it's the truth. <laughs> but I found my voice. Okay. Because I, you know, the mindset is I'm not failing. Yeah. I'm yeah. not giving up. So um, talk about the progression then at this point. Like, So eventually you're moving into leadership. Yep. What was that like? So I was an agent for over a year. Took me a long time to become confident enough that I felt like I was ready to lead others. Um, back then it was a bidding process. Okay. So you put a bid in and then the home office decided if we got promoted or not. Wow. That was the way it was in the... My younger days. Oh, and there, were, there were spots to be filled probably to be too. Filled. You know, like Absolutely. we can only promote a certain number of people. Absolutely. And, and you could move within, at that time, you could move within agencies too. So if yeah. there was an opening, say, in Montgomery, Alabama, you could bid on it and they would let you go be an agency director or SA mm. or general agent in Montgomery, Alabama yeah. for that agency. Wow. But the home office made the decision, not okay. in-house like we do today. So was there any like challenge in that? Or oh, was yeah, it, yeah. I was, I was uh, told five times I couldn't be a SA. Wow. So just kept trying for that. That, so. that persistence kind of coming yeah, back here, absolutely. Right? I was like, well, eventually they got to say yes. Yeah. You know, they gave me the job. I'm doing okay. I've kind of learned what I'm supposed to be doing. I feel like I'm ready to train others and share my my skill set with them and help change their lives mm-hmm. because you really don't know what this company and this career can do for you until you've put the time, energy, and effort in right. to learn what the process is. You got to get to the other side. You got to put in the work. You got to put the work in. You can't just show up every day. You got to put the work in. Yeah. Yeah. So so when you when you first moved into leadership, when did you know that like, all right, I want to, I want to get to the agency owner position. I want to, I want to be the was that something like from the beginning? From the like, very beginning. Yeah. I watched I watched the uh, agency owner, and I thought, man, I want to do his job one day. It looks like the end-all, be-all. You know, what, you, what was it about that that was so intriguing to you? just took to a you? few calls. You, you had a few meetings. You held the go agency meeting. Go play meeting. some golf and go, just kind yeah, of you know, like hang ate out. Ate lunch with your kids. Yeah. You know, your wife would come in after work, and you'd sit there and hang out with her. Yeah. And, you know, you got all these people in the back room that are scrambling around trying to figure out how they're going to – come up with their weekly production and meet all their quotas. And and I was like, that's the job that I want. I want to be sitting in the front office. So being the the owner is just easy. It, it is. Yeah. It looks so easy. And then how did it feel when you eventually became? We'll get to that, but did— it, Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I don't think you're ever ready. I don't think you're ever ready for any position you, you achieve at this company. Yeah. It's always terrifying to take that leap of faith into a new, a new role. But— um, I was probably more terrified there because my mentor, who was the agency owner at the time, yeah. was promoted to another office. So that's how you eventually got the agency owner opportunity? Correct. Because you you said like, you know, people move in different towns. You're yep. in your hometown. So yep. you end up getting the agency owner in your hometown. It's a big deal. So tell me that story, how that happened. Okay. So our agency owner was a Council of Champions member. Okay. And um Which is top agency owner in the company, right? Correct. For people like so the council is there's 
I don't know, probably 60 agency owners at this mm-hmm. time and maybe the top 10 Correct. in, in kind of all the metrics that they look at get selected for the council. And yep. it's a prestigious thing. You to come in, advise the company on direction that you think it should go, whether they listen to it or not, you know, but it's a, it's a discussion, right? So, so your AO is in this council meeting. He's in a council meeting and he calls me from the council meeting. At that time, we did all recruiting in our system, RMS, by the branch manager, by emails that we sent out. Okay. So he called me and he was in a panic and he said, please tell me you've sent out the email blast for the recruit for the recruiting session this week. I said, yes, sir. I got it covered. I already handled it. Because I wanted to know how to do his job before mm-hmm. I got his job. So anything that he would show me how to do, I just sucked it up. Yeah. just like a sponge yeah. because I wanted to not be handicapped if I ever did get the opportunity. Sure. So he was in a council meeting and he stated to the um, previous president that if he felt like he was in a bigger town, then he could um, recruit more people and have a bigger agency. Yeah. Well, it just so happened that the agency owner in Birmingham, Alabama was going to be a director for the company. Okay. And that office was open. So since he had made that comment, the president looked at him and said, well, congratulations, you report to Birmingham in two weeks. <laughs> and so therefore, it left the opening in Alexander City. So, um, Were you a shoe in for that or do you have to interview for it? Oh, no, for I had to interview raise, yeah. for it, had to pass a credit check, had to you know make sure that all the presidents and the senior vice presidents agreed that this was the right move. And yeah. you know, when I became an agency owner in 2008, there was only one other female agency owner. Wow. And she was in Georgia. Okay. So uh, what what was that transition? And, you know, kind of, we, we talked about this in other episodes too. Um, and for those that are watching or listening that were around kind of during this time in the company, they know that, you know, company structure was different than it is today. Absolutely. You know, the leadership was different than it is today. Um, there were some challenging times just overall for for some people um oh you, a lot of us yeah especially in that owner position um so you're now stepping into that and really what the next three or four years um there's a little bit of turmoil i guess oh you yeah because the the previous leadership is not as um a blessing as it is today you know we're we're blessed to have people you know like steve DeTaro, mike yeah. sheets luke gilliam Because at the end of the day, y'all listen. It was more ran by like a tyrant. Sure. And basically, whenever he said is what you did and whether you agreed with it or not, if you wanted to keep your position, you did what he said. Yeah. So So what's what's the mindset of somebody in that point where you feel that your leader maybe isn't listening, isn't... Run. Just run. That's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. You just want to run. So how do you not do that? You work so hard to get where you're at. You don't want to call. You don't want to. You don't want to cost yourself a career that's life lasting because of just one person's leadership. You you got to have the faith and belief that eventually his his reign's going to be over. Yeah, soon. that's got to be hard to do though. It's it, it it was very hard. It's just the thought of where this can be is is keeping you through those challenges. You think about the good times. Yeah. And you kind of overlook the emails and the phone calls and you just say a lot of yes, sir. Right. You know. And then eventually things are kind of changing, right? 2012. 2012, the uh, the, the the company dynamic kind of changes Changed. a little bit. Um, the the direction, the just the whole the whole piece. Absolutely. Right. And um so where where are you at kind of in this stage in your career? What's let's say, you know, the next you know, five years or so. Like, what, what, what is it like being an agency? Because now, now you're the owner, right? Now right. you're paying the office, correct? Correct. Now you're paying for the staff. You're paying to run the business before the company was paying it, correct? And uh, now you're you're the owner. You're the 1099 independent contractor agency owner. You own the business, kind of like your dad a little bit. You know, when yeah, you own the absolutely. service station, you yeah. own you own the agency. Um, so what what are those next couple of years like? Well. We all had the option of going from branch manager to agency owner. Right. And it's a mindset just to make that change. 
Yeah. Because it was a hard change to make because you'd had stability over here. You got a set salary. You, you got a gas allowance. You, you didn't have to pay for any of the staff. Yeah. Didn't have to buy supplies. You don't you don't pay for anything to making the 1099 jump. It, it's a hard pill to swallow, but if you do it and you did it the right way, the company shows you where you could financially be in 10 years yeah. and retire in 10 years. And that was what appealed to me was making that change because I did want to retire at an early age. And now I say I'm going to work another 10 years because I love what I do and I'm not ready to retire. So, right. And I guess I make it look easy too, yeah. like everybody else. So. You, you, eventually you, you do it long enough, you make it look easy, right? <laughs> yeah. So Fake uh, it till you make it. That's right. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, were you, re, I don't want to say resistant. I don't know if that's the right word, but like this, this big change is coming, like did business this way. And you're like, man, that was like terrible. The leadership wasn't listening yep. to me. It was really hard. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's completely shift 180 yep. degrees. And you're like, well, I don't know if I want to do that either. So are you resistant to it? For, okay. You got to have a lot of trust in the in, in the fact that you, you got to have a belief in yourself that it's going to be different with this new leadership. And the new leadership was telling us about all the great and wonderful things and how it was going to change and how it did change. Yeah. But yeah, you're very resistant. Well, it's in, so you said belief in yourself because you don't know Roger and Steve. I mean, you, they don't, you know, I don't, don't know. I don't, from, never heard of them. Yeah, they, they don't have work history. To I came up and I saw you doing like it's brand new people. So, what is that belief in yourself? What what, what do you mean by that? Because you don't know these people. You're going to follow them. That you could do what they ask, or yes. what? Yeah, you got to believe that if you follow the systems and you implement what they ask you to do, it's going to be for the better. Yeah, because just from Roger and Steve talking from that stage that very first time, I'll never forget it. There was a sense of loyalty and honesty coming out of their mouths. Like they truly mm. seemed to care. Yeah. And they promised us that it wasn't going to be the way the previous regime had been. So you got to have belief in yourself that you can actually put into systems yeah. what they ask you to do. Because it was complete change from what we'd always done. You know, it was a different leadership. Is, is there almost like a sense of, you know, if you – you resist the change, the inevitable, the longer you wait, the harder it's going to be. Absolutely. Or, yeah. And there were people that waited, mm -hmm. that didn't make that change. They were still wanting to be a branch manager because they were terrified. And then they saw all of us who had made the change, saw our renewals growing, mm -hmm. saw the ownership expanding to where we can make changes in our agency the way we saw fit instead of having to be approved by the home office. You know, people slowly and surely changed into the 1099 role. Yeah. And it's one of the best decisions I ever made. Yeah. Yeah. W was there a time after making that decision, though? I mean, it's a great decision now, looking oh, back. absolutely. Right? Yeah. Was there a moment maybe after this, a few years in, or where you really were like, man, I'm struggling, I'm questioning, is this, oh. was this the right thing? Would I get, I'm in a hole, how do I get out of it? Oh, uh, that'd be 2015. Okay. So tell so. me about 2015. So 2015, I was doing all the recruiting, doing all the training, doing all the admin work, doing everything that I could possibly do to save a dollar because I was failing. Yeah. You didn't want it. You were trying to cut expenses. Trying to do everything I could to yeah. cut expenses because I was a failing agency owner and it just killed my soul because I'd worked so hard to become that agency owner. And I had people that were under my leadership that I was about to let down. Mm. And 2015 was a hard year for me. My commission account was negative. My quality was in the tank. Um, renewals were not where they were supposed to be yet because we hadn't been on the you know, when your commission account's negative, your renewals go in your commission account, so right. you're losing that money. So I had to come to Steve DeCharo and ask to borrow some money to keep my uh, business going. Mm. And How'd that feel? Of, um, defeating. Yeah. One of the hardest decisions I have ever had to make. I had to tuck my tail between my legs. And it was just one of those days where you had to say either you're going out of business and you're calling him to tell him you're closing or I need your help financially. Yeah. So... And he believed in me. I asked for a sum of money. He only gave me half, so I guess he only believed in half of me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he believed in taking a little bit of the pressure off, but not everything. Exactly. Yeah, keep that edge on. Absolutely. That's exactly his mindset. And, you know, he bailed me out and allowed me to repay it back. And me and my uh, my ride or die at the time was Mr. Austin Green, who's now an agency owner yeah. in California, and I'm yeah. very proud of him and his accomplishments. And that, and that's a huge thing. We talk about Austin, but I mean, he's that this is like the westward expansion. Yes. He is, he is our outpost. Yes. In California and, and growing the, the whole Western uh, imprint of Liberty National. He came from you, he came he from your agency. He did. So you're, you're, you have Austin at this time and it's like, hey, we got to, we got to go. Just me and him. Yeah. 
It's me and him. And I remember having the conversation with him. I was like, all right, Austin, it's me and you. I got this money from the Charo. We're, we're going to be able to breathe for a couple months, but we got to do something. We we gotta we gotta start recruiting. We gotta we gotta we gotta retain some people. We 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 gotta grow. We gotta write production. We gotta do this. And he was like, I'm with you. You just tell me what to do. And I said, Well, the first thing we gotta do is we gotta recruit because Tacharo says everything ends and begins with recruiting. Yeah. There's nothing you can't recruit yourself out of. So that's what we did. We started recruiting like crazy and um really worked with my satellite office in Montgomery, Alabama at that time. Recruited like crazy in there, and he went down there and ran that, and I ran the Ellick City office. So you have two agents, two offices. Two offices, two offices at that yeah. at that point in 2015. Um, he he was willing to move to Montgomery and ran that deal for me, and he knew what we had to do, and I was tackling Ellick City, and we just it just exploded. Yeah. So, you know, I it's it's funny that you ask about 2015 because on our ICM now it still shows that loan that I got from 2015. Oh, really? So every week when I open up my paycheck, that reminder's there of what that year was like. And shows paid off. Oh, of course. Right, zero say, balance. Right, okay. I owe I, zero. I need to go zero. back and look to say, hey, hold on a second, where this is still outstanding. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's paid off. It's paid off. It's been paid off for a while. It's been paid off for a very long time. But it's a reminder. It is a reminder. Every week when I open up my ICM and I look at it, I'm like, you know, this is this is how it could be. So let's recruit some more people. Let's train some more people. Let's promote some more people. A good reminder kind of when you're experiencing success. Correct. To keep doing what you're doing. So 15 is a year of change. Complete year of change. You say you had to kind of humble yourself in a little bit. I did. And put in the effort. And then what was it, you know, a six month process or, you know, a year, a year in. A year in. It's year, like two years. Yeah. And it starts to it and starts then, to go. And then in 2016, I got my Columbus, Georgia office. Okay. So that was a new you know opportunity. So yeah. it was showing some improvement. And I remember having the conversation with Steve and had to meet this criteria in order to get the extra territory. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I'm not letting Steve down. He believed in me. He gave me the money. He bailed me out. So I can't let him down. So got to jump through this hoop and kind of make this happen. And then. Got Columbus and then Atlanta and then recently Anniston, Alabama. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I look back now and I think of what my life could have been if I had given up. But I'm so thankful and grateful of where I'm at now because I didn't. Yeah. Because it's so easy to quit. You fought through it. Fought through it. Fought through that adversity, which it's great. So, I mean, it, it's kind of a, a very quick, rapid change and it, I, it didn't feel quick right at no. the time I'm, I'm sure but I mean you go 2015 is a struggle 16 you start to gain some momentum and then to even get another office on uh, expanding your territory you had to have been doing some good things Absolutely. for a period of time um and then 17 goes really well and then 2018 your agency owner of the year what, what did it mean to get that phone call to say, hey, congratulations, your your agency owner of the year, kind of just knowing everything that's come from having to show up for 90 straight days just to get the interview, people doubting you, your mom telling you, oh, there's no, you know, you shouldn't be doing this, this is crazy, to um, going through some challenging times with an old leadership team, new team, and then having to humble yourself, borrow money to get through 2015, and now here you are getting a phone call, hey, your agency owner of the year, out of all the agency owners, what did that mean? One of the proudest moments of my career. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I actually thought y'all were joking when you called. <laughs> we wanted to have some fun with the call too. Yeah, but did. yeah, yeah. Y'all really did. Yeah. You know, because Well, it, it, it meant a lot to I mean, there's there's people that are listening that don't know the context. They don't know you or they haven't met you or that, you know, haven't been with the company. But I mean, it was it was really it was really nice to see, and maybe that's not the right word, but just a proud moment of 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 you, of going through what you went through to to become that. And then Absolutely. you followed it up with another and I really thought y'all were joking on that. <laughs> really thought y'all were, because I really thought, you know, there's no way you can win back to back. Nobody's ever done that. Yeah. And nobody's done it since. No. Nobody's done it since. No. You're like the Chicago Bulls of the agency owner of the year. <laughs> so um, I do want to ask, I think some people are, are curious. Let's go to the first agency owner of the year, right? That sure. was, you won that in 2018. And then we had our convention in Las Vegas in 2019. Correct. And um, when we do our annual convention, it's you know a three four day thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you come in, we have a, a welcome reception, uh, kind of a welcome party. 
Um, and then the next day we have a general session, you know, like a half day, uh, you know, Steve gives a speech. We bring in it, I guess we had Eric Thomas. Yes. Right. A motivational speaker spoke at that. So it's really cool. Very cool. And then in the after, in the evening, uh, on that same stage, then we recognize the award winners and they get to come up and, uh, Hey, congratulations. You're the number one essay. Here's a, here's your trophy. Take a picture. You know, you know, give a 30 second, 45 second acceptance speech. <laughs> and then we go through the show. You know, it's, a, it's about two, three hour it show. Is. It's a long deal. And then we get to the agency center of the year. And I remember standing on stage watching you uh, uh, give your give your speech. And not a lot of people know that you not only do you hold the record of being the agency owner of the year back to back two years in a row. You also hold the record for the longest acceptance speech mm -hmm. in the history of uh, Liberty National. Um how many pages was that really? Because I I, really I looked at it and I really I <laughs> don't know, but it was typed out in real big font. Okay. Yeah, but you know, that was my 18 minutes of fame. 18 minutes. 18 of, minutes. An 18 minute acceptance speech was yep. uh it, it I was, think I'm the reason now y'all have that rule. Oh, it is called the Hanson rule. You have you. a rule named after you for sure. Like the music <laughs> will turn on and your microphone will cut off 15 seconds after the music turns on. Because of Angela Hansen. So um, I think you thanked everybody but Toby's chickens. On, I did. Uh, and they didn't one, do right? anything for me. Yeah. So. yeah so, you know, I couldn't yeah. leave anybody out. Right. So. Right. Um, it was it was just so funny. I look over and I see that there's another page. There's. It there's was a lot of pages. There's a lot of pages. But. You but know. nobody told me I only had a certain amount of time. So. You know, I we, my team had worked hard. We had become agency owner of the year, and you'd gone through a lot to get to that absolutely. point. I think eighteen minutes is not enough time, right? Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, well, we we're, we we probably have a, less than eighteen minutes left in the podcast, though. Okay. So we'll have to. All right. <laughs> well, we won't. Through. I won't bring up that speech. I won't right. bring up my notes. Then. Right. Right. No, but it's 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 fun. So, um, you know, now kind of looking back, I, I just wanted to ask too as well because you're in Alexander City still, still, and you bought a bank. I did. The the old bank building. The old Wells Fargo building in downtown Alexander City has been there since 1863. So you've seen this building since you were a kid growing up? All my life. You know, and what does it mean to own that building and run your agency out of it? Well, it's the biggest building in town. Yeah. In downtown Alexander City. Um, It means a lot because, you know, not only do you have to have money to buy the bank. Yeah. You got a money to have operating the bank, and then it's not cheap to operate a sixteen thousand square foot office space. <laughs> That's an old building. That's an old building. Yeah, you know the power bill alone every month is what most people pay in rent. Wow. So, but the mortgage is cheap. Yeah, because I got it at a steal. Yeah, yeah. So it means a lot to know you own a piece of history in Alexander City. Sure. Is it almost a nod to that twenty-four year old shy, quiet girl sitting in an interview where they said, "Hey, you know, don't come back. Don't come back." Kind of look, yep. look what we can do. Look what we can do. You yeah. just work hard and keep showing up. It's all about that mindset, right? It is. It's about yeah. the mindset. Yeah. yeah. If you think you're going to fail, you're going to fail. It's true. It's true. Okay. Well, Angela, thank you so much for being here today. Um, it's it's just a great story and, uh, you know, overcoming challenges and becoming who you are. Um, before we finish today, just kind of the 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 one Last thing um, that we do on the podcast, as you can see, sitting you know over your right shoulder here, we have all our uh, season one guests have been listening very attentively uh, to you here <laughs> with, the, with their bobblehead. So you're going to receive a, a level up lifestyle bobblehead of you. You can display it in your office. We'll put you on uh, on the shelf here in the in the future seasons as well. Um, your bobblehead is somewhere in a container ship on its way over on the Pacific Ocean. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be here soon, but, um, okay. you know, kind of just looking at a culmination of the years of, of your career and growth and, and development and, and everything. If you were to say, um, you know, your bobblehead represents who you are today, right? But if you could go back in time and talk to that 24, 24 year old, just out of college, shy, quiet, what would you tell her? <sighs> There's going to be challenges. There's going to be lots of adversity, but no matter what. Just keep fighting. Keep going. Keep going. All right. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being here, Angela. Thank you for having me, Mike. Of course. Thanks for joining us today. We hope this episode has inspired you on your path to success. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next story. See you soon on the Level Up Lifestyle Podcast.